The injury bug has once again bitten a USC football player. Clay Helton confirmed Thursday that linebacker Christian Rector suffered a broken hand and will be forced to undergo surgery in the coming days to repair the damage. The injury occurred during practice this past Wednesday. Rector will be sidelined indefinitely, with the head coach calling a return probably weeks out according to the Los Angeles Times. Rector's 6.5 sacks this season are tied with Washington State's Hercules Madoff if for the most in the Pac-12, that number is good for 7th nationally heading into Week 9. The fact that Rector is in such a statistical position is a direct result of injury. Porter Gustin, the starter entering the season, has missed the last five games because of toe and biceps issues, which elevated Rector to one of the starting linebacking jobs. A bye week made all the difference in the world for quarterback Kelly Bryant and Clemson, as the number 7 ranked team looked a lot more like the undefeated one from a few weeks ago to capture a rain-soaked 2,410 win over Georgia Tech on Saturday night. Bryant started in the Tigers' loss to Syracuse but was injured shortly before halftime in that game to cause some doubt as to his status for a pivotal clash against the Yellow Jackets at home this week. As it turns out, all that extra rest was just what the doctor ordered for the signal caller as he threw for 207 yards and a pair of touchdowns while rushing for 67 yards in an all-around impressive effort. It wasn't all about the quarterback on offense either, as 12 different players caught a pass and tailback Travis Etienne ran for 43 yards and a score as well. The Tigers also looked much more like their old self on defense too, as the front seven dominated the line of scrimmage and recorded four sacks and 11 tackles for loss. That kind of performance was one reason why it was a rough game for Georgia Tech quarterback Taquin Marshall and the team's option offense. They fumbled three times losing one and threw for only 32 yards on the night with just three completions. Corvante Benson did manage to rush for 129 yards but most of them came off of a 65-yarder that helped lead to a field goal in the first quarter. Amazingly, the Yellow Jackets had a three and outs in an effort that seemed to frustrate coach Paul Johnson at every turn. Given events elsewhere in a crazy day of college football, it's probably safe to assume that the performance in subpar conditions will do plenty to convince the playoff committee that the loss to Syracuse was more of a blip in the radar than it was indicative of Clemson's ability. Dabo Swinney's crew looked again like the ACC favorite and likely semi-finalist and the encouraging outing will likely give the team some much-needed momentum heading into a big ACC clash at NC. State that almost certainly determined the division representative in Charlotte later this year. For all of the things Butch Jones hadn't done in his five seasons as Tennessee's head coach, there was at least this he hadn't lost to Kentucky. At least not yet. That changed Saturday night, as the Volunteers fell 2,926 to the Wildcats in Lexington, clinching a bowl game for Kentucky and, in what is all but a formality at this point, the end of the Jones era in Knoxville. Kentucky accepted the ball to open the game and promptly fumbled, leading to a 30-yard Brent Simaglia to put Tennessee on the board first. Wildcats running back Benny Snell Jr. made up for his mistake by carrying the load on Kentucky's next possession, including a six-yarder across the goal line. Tennessee responded with a nice 69-yard possession of its own, but the drive stalled at the Kentucky six-yard line, forcing a 24-yard boot by Simaglia, pulling the Vols within 76 late in the first quarter. Kentucky fumbled again on its next touch but Tennessee failed to capitalize when Simaglia missed a 44-yarder. Snell punched in a two-yard score to open the second quarter, giving Kentucky a 146 lead, but Tennessee pulled within one with a seven-play, 75-yard drive. Ty Chandler's one-yard rush gave the Volunteers their first offensive touchdown in almost four full games. Balls and offensive TD drought at 15 quarters, 35 days, 48 possessions, 231 minutes, 38 sec. Reddit CFB at Reddit CFB October 29, 2017 However, Kentucky answered with an identical drive 7 plays, 75 yards, punctuated by a 1-yard rush, Snell's third of the half. Now apparently unstoppable, an unleashed Tennessee offense responded with a 10-play, 71-yard drive that again concluded on a 1-yard Chandler 22 carries for 120 yards rush with 125 to play before the break. Tennessee returned to its regular, non-touchdown scoring ways in the second half, though. The Vols registered a first-stand goal at the Kentucky 9 and then went backward, forcing a 30-yard Simaglia field goal. The Vols defense forced another Kentucky fumble on the next possession, handing the offense the ball inside the UK red zone. But the Vols went backward from there, and a 45-yard Simaglia connection gave Tennessee a 2,621 lead with 13-24 left in the game. 
The Volunteers forced a three and out on Kentucky's next touch and could have put the game away with a touchdown, but again the drive stalled and again Simaglia trotted out for another field goal, which he missed from 43 yards out. Those missing three points would prove crucial when Kentucky took over at its own 11 with 443 remaining. The Wildcats methodically moved down the field, leaning largely on Snell's legs. Steven Johnson leapt in for an 11-yard go-ahead touchdown with 33 ticks remaining, then found Snell for a two-point conversion to put the Wildcats up three. Tennessee moved to its own 49 with two seconds remaining, allowing Jared Foranto to load up for another Hail Mary, which he completed to Jeff George, for 48 yards, leaving the Vols two yards short of a game-winning touchdown. Snell finished the night rushing 27 times for a game-high 180 yards and three touchdowns. Kentucky sacked Garantano seven times and surrendered none, helping the Cats outrush Tennessee, 289,203. The loss snapped a five-game winning streak over Kentucky and handed Tennessee 35-05, sec just its second loss to its neighbors from the north since 1985. The win lifted Kentucky to 62, making the Wildcats bowl eligible in October for the first time since 2007 and keeping them alive in the SEC East race behind Georgia. Just when you thought Mississippi State was sliding and Texas AM was ascending, the two maroon-clad teams decided to prove that things are just as difficult to as ever to sort out in the SEC West. In a game that was awfully hard to watch as the result of a pair of offenses that couldn't do much, Bulldogs quarterback Nick Fitzgerald was able to find the end zone just enough to secure a 3,514 win that makes his team bowl eligible and likely ranked in the top 25 heading into next week. The signal caller was once leading the way for MSU using both his arm and his legs, completing 12 passes for 141 yards and two touchdowns while rushing for a team high 105 yards and a score on the ground. Things would have been a bit easier for Dan Mullen's side had Fitzgerald not been sacked twice. He also tossed an interception on the first drive of the game and pressured constantly but beggars can't be choosers given how hard yards and points were to come by most of the night at Kyle Field. Running back Eris Williams also added 68 yards rushing but was mostly bottled up by a solid Aggies front seven. Speaking of the home team, things were rough from the opening few drives as AM couldn't even crack 50 yards by halftime and needed plenty of help to get over the 200 mark for the game. Young quarterback Kellen Mond was 8 of 26 for just 56 yards and threw two interceptions. He was benched in the fourth quarter for former starter Nick Starkle, but he too ended up tossing an interception that went the other way for six before rallying to toss a 70-yard touchdown to Cameron Buckley. Given that the team was coming off a bye, the unimpressive effort will likely do nothing but fan the flames of head coach Kevin Sumlin's hot seat ahead of another tough November slate. The flip side is that Mullins' Bulldogs are suddenly winners of three straight and enter a stretch where it's not out of the question that they could wind up with nine victories on the year. A visit by Alabama does loom large in two weeks down in Starkville but given how closely the Aggies played the tight earlier in the season, maybe MSU has a pretty good claim as to being the second-best team in the mighty SEC West once again. Just a few weeks ago, fans and media alike were calling for JT Barrett to be benched. Saturday night, the Ohio State quarterback thrust himself squarely into the Heisman Trophy discussion while simultaneously keeping his Buckeyes in the thick of college football playoff contention. Trailing by 18 points on two occasions to number 2 Penn State Barrett, with a huge assist from a swarming defense, was the trigger man behind number 6 OSU's remarkable comb from behind win that left the Buckeyes in complete control of the Big Ten East, and, to put them in such a position, the off-times embattled signal caller put on a performance that will live in Buckhyler. All Barrett did was complete 33 of his 39 passes, he completed his last 16 to set a single-game school record, for 328 yards, 4 touchdowns and, most importantly, no interceptions. For good measure, he led the team in rushing with 95 yards on 17 carries. By any measure, it was a virtuoso performance from a player who's taken shots from many sides over the past couple of years. Afterward, and perhaps because of the sting of the criticism that's built up, the normally reserved Barrett let loose with a rousing stream of emotion that let those inside the locker room know just how much this game, and those listening, meant to him. Not to be outdone, Urban Meyer heaped unadulterated praise on the redshirt senior quarterback in his post-game press conference below is just a brief snippet of the adulation the head coach expressed for Barrett in his exchanges with the media, in quotes distributed by the team you guys can figure out all the records. It'll just tell you, man to man, this is one man talking about another man. I don't know if I've ever had more respect for a human being and as a person, because you earn respect and you witness people in very dire straits at times, tough situations, I've never had a kid.
play perfect, but damn he was close tonight, 33 of 39. I can count four drops off the top of my head and two penalties that kept him from big completions. And head be the first one to tell you he's a product of those around him, which he is, receivers and offensive line played. That's the number one defense in America, we have great respect for. And I just can't, just how proud of JTQ you said earlier in the week teams are won by leadership. JT, you see him behind the scenes. What did you see this week in him, Coach Meyer? I think I've had him for five years. I've seen it ever since he's been playing for us. I heard about this JT Barrett guy, and he came on as a redshirt freshman. And he WASNT tall enough, WASNT this or that. But he is tough as a lion and he has an incredible skill to lead others. Since wetting the week two bed in a loss to Oklahoma, barely completed 50% of his passes, season low 183 yards passing, no touchdowns, one interception, Barrett has been on an absolute roll, in the ensuing six games, he's completed 75% of his 176 pass attempts, thrown 22 touchdowns and zero interceptions, throw in 327 yards and another four touchdowns on the ground, and you have someone who should very much be in the thick of the Heisman talk. I think that H-word is appropriate after today's game, Meyer said when asked if Barrett's performance today was Heisman Trophy candidate quality. Based on the last six games, I'd say it's more than appropriate.